If you've been thinking, dang, I can hardly afford stuff nowadays, prices sure are crazy, and then you blame the president that you didn't like for causing it, I mean, any of them work, but the one that's opposite of your usual voting party is the usual choosing, you may not completely understand how the economy actually works, but don't worry, I don't either. So I've been reading a bit about how money works and was flabbergasted to find a nugget of history. Did you know that the US government actually made it illegal to own gold? Welcome to Whiteboard Crypto, the number one YouTube channel for crypto education, and here we explain topics of the cryptocurrency world using analogies, stories, and examples so that anyone can easily understand them. In this video, we're going to be explaining a time in American history when the government made gold illegal to own, bought as much of it as they could from their citizens, and then raised the price 75%, and how all of this relates to crypto. Flash back to 1933, a time when jazz was all the rage and flapper dresses were the height of fashion. It was also a time when the American government declared it illegal to hoard gold under Executive Order 6102. The backdrop? A dire economic crisis, the Great Depression, with unemployment skyrocketing to 25%, pushing the nation into a state of emergency. Newly elected President FDR won with a whopping 98% of the electoral votes and quickly made many changes. Even declaring the country war against an economic crisis. Why this drastic measure, you ask? Well, the claim for Executive Order 6102 was that these hard times had led to rampant hoarding of gold, causing economic stagnation. Well, back then, gold was the standard for currency. We were on something called the gold standard, and every dollar had to be backed by an equivalent amount of gold. Technically, it was 40% of the gold. So this meant that every $1 of gold that the US bought, they could immediately print another $2.50 in US dollar bills essentially profiting and allowing them to stimulate the economy. The reverse happened as well. Whenever someone used their dollar bill to claim the equivalent amount of gold, the government had to get rid of $2.50 of dollar bills. As time went on during these hard times, Americans wanted their gold back. They didn't want to hold dollar bills. And there were stories of people taking their gold to other countries, which would reduce America's supply and thus cause an immediate deficit of the money supply. Well, by seizing the gold, America stopped the outflow. And by doing a required buyback, the Federal Reserve was then able to print more money, theoretically stimulating economic growth and putting Americans to work. Remember, for every dollar of gold that they received from their citizens, they could print two and a half dollars of paper bills. During this buyback, the government paid $20.67 per ounce of gold, but you should know that gold trinkets and jewelry was safe, as were the first $100 that you owned of gold. Anything past your first $100, the penalty for non-compliance was steep. You would have to pay a whopping $10,000 fine or go to prison for up to 10 years. If you're curious if this was effective, the amount of gold that was collected with this executive order was actually over 5 million pounds, and the Federal Reserve paid $1.7 billion for it. They actually kept track of how many minted coins were initially created and how many the US received back, and they estimated that around a quarter of all these US minted coins that were minted were returned. You can kind of guess what happened to the other three quarters. So the US bought as much gold as they could from their citizens, and then they made it illegal to own or trade or buy and sell with. What happens next? Well, the plot thickens. In 1934, the government bumped the price of gold up to $35 per ounce, just by saying so. Now, if you're a curious mind like me, you might be wondering, why would they raise the price if Americans can't buy or sell it? Well, in layman terms, they were cooking the books. But technically, the price of gold was raised by a whopping 75% so that the government could claim, our gold is more valuable now. And because it's more valuable, we can print more dollars. It also meant that it would be more attractive to sell your gold to the US if you were an foreign investor. In other words, increasing the US's reserve of gold. On paper, it looked like the US was buying gold for $35 and then immediately printing $87.50 of bills to stimulate the economy. This is kind of like the equivalent of telling your mortgage lender that your house is worth $20 million so that they'll lend you 80% of that or 16 million and then you can use that 16 million to pay rent for a while. But eventually you'll run out of it, which is probably a good analogy to where the US economy is now with our debt reaching over $30 trillion. 
So looking back, this gold price hike didn't magically increase the value of gold. Instead, it effectively decreased the value of the dollar. See, the amount of gold that the US had didn't change whenever they raised the price to $35 an ounce, but the amount of dollars that the US could print did. This is effectively inflating the value of a dollar. Pretty clever, huh? That wasn't the end of it though. The year 1934 also saw Executive Order 6814, where silver got the same treatment as gold, confiscated to be exact, and this time it didn't matter if your silver was jewelry or collectibles. It wasn't until 1974, a good four decades, 40 years later, that Americans could then purchase, hold, sell, and buy gold freely. Now it's worth noting that the US actually came off the gold standard in 1971, meaning that we actually don't need to hold any gold in order to print more money. So by the time in 1974, when it was finally legal to own gold again, the US didn't have any need for it. Long story short, the US has a history of printing more money to stimulate the economy. Now, of course, the majority of a nation isn't going to vote on a president who's going to increase their taxes and reduce their spending. I mean, that would lead to pain for all Americans, no matter their economic class. And in theory, when we continue to print money, things will become more and more expensive in terms of the amount of dollars that it takes to purchase them. If the US doesn't stop continually printing money, it's not outside the realm of possibilities that a gallon of milk could cost $100,000, just like these other unbacked, overinflated government currencies ended up. Germany's paper mark, Russia's ruble, Hungary's pengo, Greece's drachma, Argentina's austral, Yugoslavia's dinar, Argentina's pesos, Democratic Republic of Congo, Zaire, Zimbabwe's dollar, and Venezuela's bolivar. Now, you might be wondering why this topic of a video is on a crypto channel. Well, it's because there is a time in the future when the US or any other major world government could declare war against cryptocurrency, thus making it illegal to buy, sell, hold, or trade them. The difference is that technically nobody can take your crypto. People can physically search your house for gold if they have search warrants. They can use metal detectors or other technology to locate it and confiscate that gold but they can't do it with crypto. Similarly, a government could claim that they need your property to build an armory or a museum or a place of national security importance. Use something called eminent domain and legally take your property and pay you what they think it's worth. Cryptocurrencies though, which aren't physically located anywhere in the world, are much harder to confiscate because their access is limited to the knowledge of private keys which control them and those can be memorized. The worst harm that governments can do to crypto ownership is take down centralized exchanges or make it illegal to host your own node contributing to the crypto network. Doing both of these successfully may be as effective as just taking your crypto itself. Cryptocurrencies are meant to be used as a store of value and a medium of exchange, but if you can ever transfer that value to a house, a car, some food, or a meal, then they're essentially worthless. If the network you use to keep track of your crypto balance, like the Bitcoin blockchain for example, was taken down, maybe literally by the removal of all the computers contributing to the network, then your Bitcoin wouldn't be worth anything. There would be no record of you having, owning, or spending Bitcoin. And if you had no internet access due to a totalitarian regime, it also becomes worthless. You need internet to spend crypto. And if it's illegal to use cryptocurrency to a point where nobody else wants to risk being paid in crypto by you, then it also becomes worthless. This video was meant to teach you that there was a point in history that blew my mind, but I think it's pointing out because history often rhymes. So we should be keeping an eye out for some of the signs that the gold holders saw in the 1930s. As I end this video, I wanna encourage you to visit whiteboardcrypto.com and sign up for our newsletter, which is where this video was inspired from. I often write out interesting emails and the ones that receive the best response are eventually turned into videos like this one. You can get free access to a ton of other cool stories and useful cryptocurrency information and news just by entering your email. Plus, I'll instantly send you my age-old DeFi for Beginners course. Right now, I'm working on some content about privacy and staying anonymous online and in real life. Anyways, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I really hoped you learned something. And most of all, I hope to see you in our next video.